when the road is done And you can no longer see Let my love throw a spark And have a little faith in me morning and welcome to you all. We gather, of course, to remember and indeed to celebrate the life of Marianne Klarkovich, a man who lived among us with determination and passion, both for his chosen career and for life itself. This day and this time are sacred to Marianne's memory. We would have wanted to have him as a family member, colleague, father or friend for a lot longer. But that's not the way of life. We're called to support one another in our loss and to remember Marianne with affection and with pride. He was the loved son of Boyana and Milan, formerly the husband of Marion, with whom he fathered Tomas and Moya. More recently, he shared his life with his partner, Sarah. And of course, over the years, Marianne was a friend to many. I'm Don Manning. It's a privilege to be here today and to lead this service on behalf of the family. There are some unable to be with us today, including Zara, a niece in London, as well as many members of the Sardar and Klarkovich families. But you can be sure that they're thinking of us at this time. Those of you who know Marianne well know that he'd be happy to be the centre of attention one last time. If we were here among us, you can be sure you'd hear his loud, booming voice. He'd work the room, he'd say hello. He'd make you all feel incredibly welcome. That's the way he was. Marianne had, over the years of his life, developed his own spirituality. It was based around his generous heart, born out of empirical research and a desire for the colleagues of his profession to serve others well. It also came forth in the many close friendships that he nurtured among those that he regarded as his own in the world. So it's important that we celebrate Marianne's life, both with our laughter as well as with our tears. I believed that he'd be pleased that we're here to say goodbye. He was a man who loved having family and friends around him, and he wouldn't want us to be anything but honest about his life. The family have chosen speakers to represent the many aspects of Marianne's life and hopefully we will cover many of those rich things that were there, that were part of who he was, part of a man whom you couldn't encapsulate or hold because he was indeed a man larger than life. Hopefully any sadness we feel in our hearts will be tempered with affection, with love, with good memories and a large pinch of humour. To commence our reflection on Marianne's life, let's hear the words of a piece of verse called Instructions by Arnold Crompton. In this you may see some images of his life, you may even hear the whispers of his voice. When I have moved beyond you in the adventure of life, gather in some pleasant place and there remember me with spoken words old and new. Let a tear fall if you will, but let a smile come quickly, for I have loved the laughter of life. Do not linger too long with your solemnities. Go and eat and drink and talk. And when you can, follow one of your life's new trails or climb one of life's high mountains. 
Chew the thoughts of a book which challenges your soul. Use your hands some bright day to make a thing of beauty or to lift someone's heavy load. Though you mention not my name, though no thought of me crosses your mind, I shall be with you. For these have been the realities of life for me. When you face some crisis with anguish, when you walk alone with courage, when you choose the path of right, when you give yourself in love, I shall be very close to you. I have followed the valleys. I have climbed the heights of life. At a time like this, we reach into our hearts and minds to hold close the memories we have of the person who has died. For this reason, life stories gain a new significance. They remind us that we have shared a journey, that we're called to be thankful, and that we're to take new meaning as we journey on. And so I call on Marianne's brother Marco to come and retell some of the story of his life and make tribute to him. Uh, thank you, Don. Uh, Don doesn't know Marion from a bar of soap, <laughs> but he did incredibly well, don't you think? Um, <laughs> he probably probably uh, l listens very well, something my wife tells me I never do very well. <laughs> I don't think she's right. Uh, can you hear me all right? Because I'm two foot taller than you. Is that all right? Great. Um, Marian, uh, everyone knows Marian uh, just loved all things IT. He had an iPhone, an iPad, uh, an iTV, uh, an iComputer, an iMarian. Um, <laughs> and there's only one way, really, I think is appropriate that we start um, my speech. Roll it. Marianne here. Please leave a message and at the end of your message, press hash and I can call you back. Cheers. What do you think? <laughs> Feel free to applause often because he, you know, he liked to be adored and, and he is. Yeah, so that reflected two things. Marianne's uh, love of IT and Marianne's uh, sort of passion of things Maori, which uh, now, I, I don't necessarily sort of have myself, but uh, yeah, but he loved that. In fact, uh, just just on that theme, uh, he, he told me, or uh, well, someone told me, was it, uh, I can't remember exactly, but Marian wanted to start a, a tribe of his own called Nati Marian. <laughs> he was serious. He was very serious, and it was going to be sort of revolved around the Taranas, which are the Dalmatian Maori mix that happened up in Northland when the when the Croatians arrived and and, and had to have sex with someone, um, <laughs> not their wives because they were a long way away. Um, I better get back on track now. If I ramble too long, if I ramble too long, just stop me. Uh, if not, my son will because he, he often tells me what I do wrong. Um, Okay, so I have, uh, I have a job here to speak on behalf of my mother and my father and myself and Marian. So Marian rattles around in my head, I can hear him. So, you know, I'll talk on his, be <laughs> I'll talk on his behalf as well. Um, I've had several meltdowns, so hopefully I won't melt down in the process. He wouldn't want me to. Um, Marian spent... Um, well, the other job we got, I nearly forgot, Mum, is that we, uh, we have to uh, not only wrap his life up in a speech, but we're going to have to bury him in the soil of the city he loved, and he really loved Wellington. There's no two ways about that. Now, Marian spent most of his adult life um, uh, focused on studying, sorry, studying the um, humanity, really, the whole of a human not just the disease state, uh, he, he was very interested in, the, in the, both the body and the spirit of, uh, of, of, of a human and uh, spent a good chunk of his life studying it. So he, um, where are you going? He, um, 
he looked at the roles and the roles of people, their needs, their frustrations, and their contradictions. And I'm sure all of us, uh, you know, are bound with particularly the frustrations and contradictions. So, given that uh, you know he was a man focused on uh, on looking at the questions and the evidence and the proof, what would Maria make of his death? Uh, first up. Marianne would be seriously pissed off he died. Um, seriously pissed off. Marianne told me that uh, he anticipated he'd be living uh, at least another 30 years. Uh, he was on a quest to uh, hit his, um, his ideal weight for the last 18 months. I've never seen him work so hard at uh, exercising. He regularly had the hairs from his uh, nose and ears plucked. And, and he also dyed his hair every four weeks. So, <laughs> so okay, so, that, so, so he'd be pissed off. But I, I think given the evidence, uh, he, would, um, you know, he, he, he would have to agree that, that he's dead. Uh, and and, um, and he died of a heart attack, a massive heart attack. It was unexpected. Um, he didn't have uh, uh, any symptoms. Uh, they did discover when they examined his coronary arteries that they were, they were, they were not in good a state. Um, so, um, yeah, probably at this point he'd like to do a little health message to all the guys out there, middle-aged guys who are overdoing things a bit. Uh, go and get your heart checked out. and. And if you're interested, I, I can do a little discount at the Silver Stream <laughs> Health Centre. <laughs> I'll give you a little voucher later. Um, and also, you know, the evidence is we have his dead body here, right, right here. And uh, and when I saw, I wrote a poem, and there you go. I don't know if you've read the thing, and there I'm a bit of a poet. Uh, and uh, when I uh, and mum and dad uh, had to go and see Marian straight after he died. Now that was a difficult door to open. Um, I was just, uh, you know, I just keep flashing through my head, you know, where are you now? Because his body's here, but, you know, Marian's not there, is he? His spirit's not there, or his soul, or however you'd like to. Marian's not religious, you know, his life force or energy. So. So oh, I really was quite desperate to find out, and I whispered in his ear, you know, where are you now? And, and, and that's an eternal question, isn't it, Don? Everyone's asking the questions, is every one of us is going to die? No one thinks we're going to die, um, but we're definitely all going to die. I nearly died, as everyone knows, um, and, uh, and I was rattling around in the old twilight zone with the white light. And, and I didn't quite work out what was going on, and next week I was back here on earth. So I sort of got a sense there's got to be something, um, whatever sort of form that takes. And it struck me that Marian always want to be first that everything is in the perfect <laughs> position to tell us. Okay, so outstanding researcher, uh, and he's in the right spot, he's dead. So. The challenge I put to you, Marian, uh, is uh, is use your skills and you know do the study, uh, look for evidence, um, maybe make a proof, and then somehow let me know, all right? Or anybody know, but preferably me, because there's a commercial buck in this. Um, <laughs> You can, you can Facebook me, you know, Twitter me, he did all that sort of stuff, but I mean, I, I'd prefer just a little whisper in an ear or, or in a dream, and then we'll publish that, and, uh, and, and I, I mean, I've never published a thing, Marian's published hundreds of articles, uh, he nearly published something that I was involved with and I was going to get a mention, so, so we'll publish that together. Okay, so anyway, that's a public uh, sort of um, request, so you're on notice. Have I gassed on too long? No. no. So now I'm going to do a little chrono a chronological summary of our life, which is the easier part of, of the speech. Um, click. The good looking guy is, the, is dead. You're not good looking anymore, Dad. <laughs> That's not true. And, 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 and the good looking lady is mum, and yes, you're still good looking, mum. 
I'm married. Um, so he was born on the 23rd of the 10th, 57, which you know, a lot of us know. What, what, what a lot of you don't know, he was 14 pound born, so he was about six kilos. 54. 54, did I say the wrong day? Sorry. And, uh, and we hunted long and hard for some pictures of Mariam when he was a little baby. Couldn't find any because 14 pound babies are seriously ugly. <laughs> and, <laughs> And I was only 13 pound born. <laughs> Couldn't find any. And uh, so uh, mum was uh, Slovenian and, uh, and she arrived in Bremen where he was born uh, because she uh, had to flee. Um, she was an anti-communist demonstrator and they were threatening to beat her up and throw her in prison so she took off. They did. But, uh, <laughs> mum said they did throw her in prison but they're going to throw her in prison again. Dad took a different route. Uh, he deserted from the army um, because uh, some Serbian lieutenant pissed him off and uh, he and four other people rode across the Adriatic, landed in Italy and then he made his way up to Bremen. Uh, there were several distinguishing sort of uh, things to talk about when Marion was a little boy. Firstly, uh, mum and dad had a few teething problems when they first met and 60 years later they haven't quite resolved them but uh, so Marion was in a solo family for about a year till dad turned up again and, uh, and that could relate a little bit to his uh, socialistic leanings his champagne socialistic leanings um, and, and so Marion was the best man at their wedding that's distinctive, you know, two year olds not often the best man at the parents wedding and uh, at age three, um, I turned up, and uh, I think Marion was a little cheesed off about that because you know he'd been the centre of attention, and he uh, he tried to kill me. <laughs> no, literally. So mother found him with a great big sort of glass uh, ink pot, just like this. <laughs> Is that right, mum? Yeah, she agrees. And, uh, and anyway, she, she, just, she told, told him maybe he shouldn't do that. And, uh, and he didn't. The other thing is, Marion didn't speak a word, not a syllable, till, he, till I arrived at three. And then from the hospital, coming home, he took off and just started talking absolutely fluently. So obviously he, uh, he was a great thinker and he did, didn't talk until he knew what he wanted to say. Then at age four, he, uh, we won't go through every year, at age four, <laughs> he, um, he declared that he was going to be a doctor. And he never wavered. So, you know, he's a man who sticks to his word. Okay, and, and the last thing in his early life was at age five, um, mum and dad took the incredibly courageous step to go 12,000 miles away from what they knew or close to their homes and to a country that they didn't know the language of, to a culture that they really didn't understand or relate to. But it was uh, the best move they could have made in terms of Muddy and, and my um, careers, if you like to call it that. And, um, and I think if Muddy was alive now, and I'm sure he would like to thank you, Mum and Dad, for all the hard work and love. He did. Thank you. And, um, and we wouldn't have reached uh, where we got to without that. Just give me a second. Okay, and he also would want you to, um, to smile and be happy because you two have been through um, a shitload of things and you're survivors, so you're just gonna have to keep going. And that's that. Quickly going through his academic stuff because there's other people who speak in depth and they know more about Marion's academic world than I do. Um, you know, Marion went to school in, uh, in Upper Hutt, Trenton Primary, Ferguson Intermediate, but his, his academic career started in St Pat's, really. St Pat's. That's him and me in our St Pat's uniform. I'm the cool guy. <laughs> On the right. And, um, and the house is where we grew up for 15 years. And, um, 
and some pets, they sort of, they did him an injustice because uh, because he was, Marion was a bumbling, sort of overweight, shy guy back then. I mean, that sounds incredible, but that's what he was like. And, and they made it worse because they bunged him in the lowest stream in the school. They thought he was dumb. And that sort of rocked him a bit, really. It rocked his confidence and, uh, and it took him a long time to recover from it. He did recover, obviously. You've seen him at work, but... Uh, uh, they couldn't suppress him forever because after three years, uh, you know, his intellect just shone through, and uh, and they they whacked him into the top stream. But um, but yeah, I I, I thought uh, perhaps uh, perhaps they shouldn't have done that. Mind you, I, I did benefit from that because they got guilty. You know, like when he left school, got into med school, they thought, sure, these Kliangovich is quite bright, and I. Uh, I went there, and, and uh, even though they shouldn't have, they put me in the top stream. <laughs> Not bad. I've always been an opportunist. Um, so up to 18, oh, just a little... Uh, just a little aside, even though he was not confident, not athletic, and, uh, and you know, was a bit of a sort of nerdy bookworm, uh, he, he, wa he was still incredibly strong. There, there was a little incident where uh, I was doing some crazy stuff and I'd blown myself up. I was um, on a pile of these huge um, concrete uh, uh, pipes, huge, about 20 metres long, weighed a tonne. My dad said, get off, get off, get off. And of course I didn't, and boom, they came down and they caught me, you know, and the rest of them were about to come down as well. Samson goes down one end, and because he wanted, he was going to save his little brother, and he picked up this thing. There's no way he should have picked that thing up, right? Honk, up it went. So he was my big brother. Anyway, we lived, to the age of 18, we lived in that little house. Oh, <laughs> we lived in that little house, um, it's like 70 square metre little box thing and uh, so we were real poor by the way, seriously poor and I think that's where Martin got some of his socialistic leanings and, <laughs> and, um, and uh, unbeknownst to me he, um, you know, I was, I was leader of the gang and Shanghai's and trolleys and forts and all that sort of stuff, and then I thought that's where the world lay. Marion was sneaking around with the girls. <laughs> Even then, he he was, you know, I, and I didn't know it. And uh, and then one time, it's sort of on that same theme. I came to him with a rash in the pelvic area. Um, you know, I was about ten. I think he was about thirteen. And uh, I was really, really worried. I mean, I had this little rash. No itch, no nothing. And I went to my big brother, you know, I wasn't going to go to dad, God. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and so I, I pulled my pants down and, um, and he falls to the floor laughing his head off. And, uh, you know, remember, I'm, I'm the guy playing guns and, and he's the one chasing girls. And, I said, well, what is it? What is it? And he said, oh, they're just baby pubic hairs. <laughs> <laughs> True to God. And I didn't know what a pubic hair was. <laughs> I retreated. So anyway, just quickly, leaves some pets, goes to Metzl, gets becomes a doctor, goes to Edinburgh, gets something else, uh, goes to Karori, becomes a GP, goes to the medical school, becomes a lecturer, and then, I mean, how nutty is this, in his spare time, does a PhD in philosophy. Kim, Kim will talk about it. And it, very, very proud of it, said it was incredibly difficult to do, and, uh, and he gave me this book when he finished. And, she, I mean, it's a huge thing, you know, and... Uh, and it became incredibly, it became incredibly useful to me for all my insomniac patients. <laughs> <laughs> I used to hand it out to them in uh, two paragraphs and they were cured. <laughs> it, it, I think it was, uh, I mean, you'll probably get a bit pissed off. Yeah, I think it was, um, the title was The Relevance of Single Case Study. Ooh. <laughs> Calm down. <laughs> then, Marion got married in 1980. Yes? 81. 81. 81, oh God. Um, and had two children, Tomash and Moyer, who are here, and I, 
uh, and Marion's here and uh, we get on very well and I uh, hope we do forever. Um, and he lived in Karori in Wellington and um, Actually, before I forget, Marty, and if you don't want to take up that challenge about that, you know, letting us know where you are, um, just let me remind you that uh, you're going to go to Karori Cemetery later, where we're going to bury you, and uh, it was shut to new entrance. They, they said, go off you go to um, Makara. We went there, and I thought, holy smoke, hasn't quite got the right feel. So I pulled out all the stops, and we did a sharp deal. And I've got a pre-loved site for you there. <laughs> room, for, room for mum and dad. And, uh, you know, I can still sort of cancel it if you don't agree to do the... <laughs> Keep it in mind. Anyway, 2005, went to Canberra. Both he and Marion, I think, they didn't want to leave um, Wellington, but, you know, the job was too, too good an opportunity to miss. Then in 2010, he separated from Marion. I won't go into the discussion I had about that um, to him. And, um, and for six months, he's been the partner of Sarah Anderson over there. Um, lastly, I suppose, on that theme, I'd like to say on Marion's behalf uh, to his whole family that he fought hard to stay alive. Um, and he's sorry he didn't make it. He definitely loved life with a passion, um, but you just need to keep going on without him. Um, he loved life with a passion. <laughs> he, he certainly loved passion. There's a few whispers going on about what he was doing when he actually had his heart attack. Just for, just for the record, he was making a sandwich. Okay, lastly, because I think I'm boring people, Don. Um, we all have intimate moments that we remember, that we treasure. I spent a lot of time with Muddy in, uh, in the uh, last 18 months. I spent a lot of time with Muddy all the time, but in the last 18 months particularly so. Um, there was um, one time we had lunch and he was feeling a bit sorry for himself and battered up and you know life was being a bit tough on him, he thought. Um, and he said, look, I can handle anything, Marco. Any adversity, is a lot, as long as I know that you'll never reject me. Mm, hell will freeze over before I do that, Marian. Um, Marian, you thought that he was a great researcher. that he was a pretty good doctor and professor. He thought he was an imperfect son, definitely an imperfect husband and father. But to me, he was the perfect brother. Hold on. Okay. That's uh, my relationship with Marion. Thank you.